Hello listeners and viewers. We are happy to present to you at this time a play titled A Raisin in the Sun that is written by Lorraine Hansberry, a black African American woman writer. Lorraine Hansberry acquired a celebrity status in March 1959 with her Broadway production of this play titled A Raisin in the Sun. She attained a celebrity status as it was the first play to be produced on Broadway by an African American woman. And also, Lauren Hansberry was the first woman in America to be honored with New York Drama Critics Circle Award. A Raisin in the Sun is a play in three acts. It centers around three generations of the younger family. It depicts a working class black family with its humor, pathos and frustrations. The play is set in Chicago's South Side in the 1950s. In Lena Younger's Vision and Success, Lauren Hansberry presents to us the possibilities of a black family. The play also reflects a black family's struggle for empowerment and they can do this by standing united and facing the racist assaults in the new all-white neighborhood. Now, this play being written by a woman and an African-American woman in particular, we have to look at a few ideas related to feminism and black feminism. Any definition of feminism is conditioned by a number of factors that include issues like race, ethnicity, education, history and ideology. Feminism in general is the ideology of women's liberation from manifold shackles of gender and class. The focus of feminists varies generally according to their sociological, historical, ideological and other backgrounds. For instance, a Marxist or a socialist feminist would focus upon the social distinctions between man and woman. The oppressions of a patriarchal society that generally discriminates on the basis of race, class and gender were the concerns of early 20th century feminist playwrights. Resisting patriarchy and its power, white and black women playwrights in general dramatized Vietnam War, violence, racism, sexism and the repressive measures of both the government and their families. Topics like inequality, oppression and injustice unite them as feminists. Now, black feminism is slightly different from white feminism or feminism in general because there is a strange twist and irony in the affairs of the black woman. The black woman basically did not enjoy the ideological benefits of femininity. In fact, from dawn to dusk, they toiled along with their men under the lash of their cruel white masters as slaves. Because of slavery, they underwent terrible hardships. The African American women and their clubs, therefore, were naturally distinct and different from their white counterparts. They did not fight on exclusively feminist premises or only for feminist rights alone. In fact, they had all encompassing views and ideology. They fought for the most crucial and progressive issues. They strove not only for women's issues, but for issues that pertain to humanity in general. Lauren Hansberry, as told already, was born in a middle class family and she was brought up in a social life and society that brought to her home major cultural and political figures because her uncle was an eminent educationist and her father, Carl Hansberry, was a realtor of high status. Her father moved their family into an all-white neighborhood in Chicago in real life. But an angry mob in Chicago 
disliked their move into this all white neighborhood and hurled bricks through the window and Hansberry herself narrowly missed being hit by the bricks. And this is a setting she used in the play A Raisin in the Sun. Later, her father fought and won a limited ruling in the Supreme Court that challenged segregated housing in the US societies and the cities. She was also inspired by a poem written by Langston Hughes titled Harlem and she begins her play. In fact, the title of her play is from this poem. The play Harlem goes like this. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? or fester like a sore, maybe it just sags like a heavy load or explode. Hansberry says that she was inspired to write this particular play after she watched a play in which black women were presented in a derogatory light. Therefore, it was imperative for Hansberry to present black women in their true character as builders of their men, the black race or African American race, as opposed to the existing false notion that black women were emasculators of their men. This idea of black women as emasculators of their men was actually a myth that was perpetuated by the white society for its own ulterior motives, that is, to drive a wedge into the black male and female relationships. Unfortunately, the black men believed in this myth and began to abuse their women. A Raisin in the Sun is a play in three acts. The first scene of Act 1 introduces to us the plot that is, a family waiting for a chick that will help them realize their dreams. In the next scene, that is scene 2 of Act 1, Lena Younger finally receives the $10,000 chick. But we begin to find a conflict between the dreams of Lena, the mother, and her son Walter, which is continued in Act 2, where the plot gets intriguing. Lena refuses to help her son Walter set up a liquor business and instead she wants to invest part of the money in a down payment for a house in a white neighborhood called Clybourne Park. Because she refuses Walter the money to set up a liquor business, Walter goes into a depression and becomes an alcoholic. However, after making the down payment Lena relents and hands over the remaining money to Walter. But we find that the second act ends in the darkness of desolation because Walter was foolish to trust his partner Willie Harris with the entire money and the family is in a state of shock because he is cheated by his partner Willie Harris. Then suddenly Lena decides to remain in the ghetto. And Walter is given a wonderful temptation and he is almost ready to accept Carl Lindner's offer which is presented in Act 3. However, the play ends with Walter's acceptance of his mother's challenge and we find at the end of the play that the whole family decides to take pride in their blackness and despite all the difficulties even her daughter-in-law tells mother-in-law that is Lena that they will work however hard it requires but claim ownership of the new house. Lena Younger, the widow of Big Walter has received $10,000 insurance money on the death of her husband. She dreams of extricating the family from the ghetto kind of a life and the society. Walter Lee wants to set up a liquor business and change his economic fortunes. Lena and young Walter have conflict over these dreams and another angle is presented to this fight over money because we have Benita, the daughter of Lena, aspiring to be a medical doctor. Lena Younger's down payment for the house in Clybourne Park devastates her son's dreams. 
But when she realizes that her son is dejected and is in despair, she gives him the balance that includes Benita's share for medical education. Walter gives the money to his partner who cheats him. Walter in his despair considers the offer made by Carl Lindner, a representative from the Clybourne Park. However, he declines the offer once he is challenged by his mother. He undergoes a total transformation and refuses to accept Lindner's offer. The family overcomes this setback and prepares to move into their dream home, and thus laying claim upon their version of the American dream. The conflict between the dreams of these two strong characters, Mama and Walter Lee, build up the tension in the play. The societal determinants and racial discrimination bring a climax to the tensions within the younger family. Lena Younger, the mother, appears as a typical emasculating black woman. But before we put that blame on her, we must understand the slavery in general and American slavery in particular because these two have played a major role in developing and sharpening the thrust towards freedom that was what the black women were fighting for. Freedom in all aspects. The kind of slavery that prevailed in America, let me tell you very quickly, it actually brought about the disintegration of the black family. You know, the black woman had to surrender even her childbearing and procreating functions to serve her white master's alien predator and economic interests. And therefore, the brutality of her oppressors and the circumstances around her actually made her a missionary. And her salvation was only in promoting racial consciousness and in practicing resistance. It's this background that Hansberry's characterization of Lena Younger is interesting and also significant. Lena enables her family to empower itself to unite and face the challenges of the world outside. Lena's dream for a house of our own in a peaceful surrounding particularly a white surrounding, is part of the American dream. Which woman wouldn't like to have a dream house of her own? But this dream had been deferred for the 40 years for which, in which her husband slogged doing two jobs to feed the family. Her dreams are defined in terms of freedom to move and live wherever they like. She empowers Walter by trusting him with the remainder of the money. She gives him actually a chance to prove himself. She tells Walter to keep aside Benita's share of her medical school. And let me quote, she says, The rest you put in checking account with your name on it. I am telling you to be the head of this family from now on like you're supposed to be. Unquote. She tries to rebuild actually Walter's battered self and counteract the brutalizing influence of a racially discriminating society. She gives Benita, her daughter, freedom to choose between her two suitors, George Murchison and Joseph Asagai. She acts only as a counselor and not as a dictator to Benita. While Mama is willing to have a piece of the American dream, Walter Lee unfortunately wants to claim the whole of the American dream. And therefore, we find Walter Lee is presented as an angry young man with pajamas that look mismatched in the opening scene. And therefore, everything about him seems to be mismatched too. It appears so because he dares to dream and his dreams collide with those of his mother, wife and sister. His frustrations emerge out of his discontent with his life as a chauffeur. He is painfully aware of the societal inequalities that create the disparities in his status and those of the white boys of his age. He refuses to be relegated to his place and dreams of making it big and rich by entering into liquor business. 
His mother's decision to give him the remainder of the money after the down payment on the house enables Walter to find his identity and his role as a man. However, it is only an emotional transformation because his self-esteem and identity revolve around his obsession with money and materialism. Mama's challenge, however, helps a degenerate Walter undergo a real spiritual transformation and he finally comes into his manhood. Thus we find a deified Walter in his transformation. Hans Perry also seems to satirize people like George Murchison and the middle class African Americans particularly and the values that they represent. It is not a criticism against the desire for success but it is actually the hollowness of their values that Hans Perry is concerned about. George Murchison's values are associated with money, fashions, luxuries and conformity to the white Eurocentric behavior and pattern. Through Benita, Hansberry also looks at the function of education. Education is not just to get degrees and a job to earn bread. It is supposed to make one sensitive to the issues of life. However, education for people like George does not bring real culture and civilization. Their culture and civilization appears only in amassing wealth and becoming more materialistic. Assimilators like George Murchison alienate themselves from the African and the African American culture. As an alternative to assimilation, Hansberry wants African Americans to be aware of their connection to Africa. This interconnectedness is symbolized in Joseph Asagai, the intellectual. Joseph Asagai is a character in contrast to George Murchison. Asagai embodies the black power movement in America and also in Africa. Hansberry's racial pride asserts when Benita wears the Afro dress brought by Asagai from Nigeria. She changes her hairstyle into an Afro style and puts on African music to a dance in which Walter also joins. And Walter imagined himself as an Ethiopian warrior sparing down his enemies. All these aspects emphasize the Africanness of Hansberry's consciousness. In fact, Hansberry believes in the greatness of black civilization, its heritage and superiority. In one of her interviews, Hansberry says, quote, Blacks had never dropped an atomic bomb on anybody. Blacks had never systematically attempted to exterminate an entire race of people. Blacks had never inflicted on humanity anything so horrendous as the Atlantic slave trade and North American slave system. Benita is also representative of the black women of the modern generation who are searching for their own identity. That's why we find Benita flitting from various interests from photography to guitar classes. In Walter Lee's wife Ruth, Hans Perley merely touches upon the very important issue of women's right to have control over their bodies. This right to choose to abort children is a precursor to the legalization of abortion that eventually took place in 60s and 70s. A discussion of Lauren Hansberry's play Raisin the Sun would be incomplete without a brief discussion of the theatrical aspects of the play. A Raisin in the Sun is a typical example of realistic modern domestic drama. Realism helps Hansberry to present events that take place in the everyday life of blacks. The characters are all recognizable human beings. Hansberry portrays blacks or African Americans in their daily life. The settings and scenery at the beginning of the play bear a close resemblance to the reality of the African American life. Hansberry notes that the furnishings are commonplace, they are typical and they are also worn out. 
Thus, they are symbolic of the tiredness and the weariness of the younger family. Hansberry writes in the production notes to the play that, though they try to cover the worn out places in the carpet, yet the carpet, quote, has fought back by showing its weariness with depressing uniformity, unquote. The youngers are worn out chasing the American dream. The carpet is thus representative of the younger family's determination to unite and strive together for the realization of their dreams. The youngers apartment is considered a rat trap. To emphasize the experience of a dingy ghettoized atmosphere, Hansberry makes use of realism with reference to lighting. You know, in any play, stage lighting is important. A realistic play requires light from the natural sources. Hansberry's production notes say that the sole natural light which the family may enjoy in the course of the day is only that which fights its way through the only window in the kitchen area. So you can imagine what kind of a darkness prevails. And Lena wants to extricate her family from this dark, desolate and hopeless place. And therefore, she is justified invest in investing in a place that has, quote from the play, a whole light, lot of sunlight. The initial gloominess of the opening scene gets darker. There's a somber note suggesting a pall of gloom when Walter begins to consider Lindner's offer in the first scene of Act 3. The stage direction indicates a sullen light of gloom. From a sense of tiredness, the younger family comes to a sense of gloom, waste and eventually death, the death of their dreams because they've been duped of the money by Walter's partner. And Mama tells Walter, we ain't never been that dead inside. To that, Benita replies, quote, well, we are dead now. All the talks about dreams and sunlight that go on in this house, it's all dead now. The most important stage prop in Lena's play or Hansberry's play is a feeble little plant growing doggedly. It is symbolic of youngers or the family's life and their dreams. Lena waters it and nurtures it by exposing it to the sunlight. She says her children are as spirited as the plant that never had enough sunshine or nothing. She takes immense care that her raggedy looking old plant does not get hurt on the way to the new house. Another interesting point you should keep in mind about the theatrical aspects of this play is the ringing of the bell. Two times the bell rings and that reminds us of the play Macbeth and the Potter scene where we find the ringing of the bell. In A Raisin in the Sun, the ringing of the doorbell initially acquires ominous proportions. A happy, healthy and cheerful situation occurs at the first instance. When the bell eventually rings with the postman delivering the check, they are all stunned. Hansberry writes, quote, Ruth is the first to come to life again. You know, you can anticipate that sense of expectancy that is built around as they wait for the postman who is supposed to come the day and deliver the check. The postman thus becomes a harbinger of light, life, joy and the materialization of their dreams. But on the later occasion when Bobo rings the bell, the door bell, telling that Willie Harris has run away with the money, it spells their doom and devastation. It is also interesting to note the metaphor of rainbow at the end of the play. Hansberry's craftsmanship of language is evident in the different dialects of the characters. In George Murchison, Asaga and Benita's language, we find formal English of educated, sophisticated intellectuals. On the other hand, we find Lena's idiolect, which is full of multiple negatives, dropped letters, peculiar diction, and plurals which is representative of the working class African American English. And at the end of the play we find another instance where Walter uses typical black English as an act of defiance. 
quote, we don't want to make no trouble for nobody or fight no causes and we will try to be good neighbors. That's all we got to say. Hansberry's choice of the various speech patterns of her characters also bears evidence to the realistic surface that she uses to lend credibility to her characters. In conclusion, we can say that Hansberry, though a feminist, cannot be categorized as a typical feminist who is fighting for female liberation or only for feminist issues. In A Raisin in the Hassan, Hansberry is not in support of either matriarchy or patriarchy. You should remember, in fact, that she is more interested in showing that there should be compatibility between the two. She says black men and women need to be united and committed to each other and to certain values. Build up a family which can ultimately build an African American society. And this can tra help them transcend the various limitations. Discussing the structure of a raisin in the sun, Hansberry says that she created two major characters, Lena Younger and her son Walter Lee. Both of them are too strong to be dominated by each other. So that tells that Hansberry is not a typical feminist. And also, Lena frequently invocates or refers to her husband, Big Walter. And that shows that she is not a typical feminist. Her fem vision is a humanist vision, which is born out of a deep love and empathy for all humankind. Hansberry wants the black men to understand that black women are not their actual castrators and therefore should be treated as their comrades. Thus, we can find that Lauren Hansberry's play, A Raisin in the Sun, was an important landmark in the history of African American women drama particularly and also in the history of black feminism. And I hope that this play will inspire you to read more and more plays written by African American women. I hope you really enjoyed looking at this play and hope to see you in another class.